You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. It wasn't a matter of I want to do this. It was literally I have to do this. It was something inside of me, almost like, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's almost like I knew that I was going to be something different. I always knew, and then I got this thing, this is it. I didn't have to spend time doing other things. I had income coming in. And um, the ironic thing is, like, when you're starting out and you really need the help, you don't get any. And nobody really understands. What, nobody really understood what I was doing, even my girlfriend or, or anyone that was around me didn't understand what you're doing here is a bit strange. Why are you eating every three hours? Why are you doing this? Why are you just, you're not, you don't want to go out, you don't want to do anything, you're just doing this. This is a bit obsessive. Why are you doing this? When you start to get successful and win contests and get accolades and get covers on the magazines, everyone's like, ah, oh, okay. And now they start to get a bit behind you. And the more successful you are, the more support you get, the more money you get. Um, but at the start, you get nothing, you know. One time I worked on a nightclub and there was a huge, uh, huge riot in there. And uh, one of the bouncers got stabbed, nearly died and all this stuff. And I said, screw this, I don't everyone loves you, right? Yeah. And I was naive enough to believe it. Like everyone loves me because I'm such a great guy and I'm such a successful guy. And everyone loves me because they love, no, they don't fucking love you. They're around you because it's good for them and what they can take from you. I was always searching that. Like, no matter what it is naturally, chemically, like, we're just yeah. always wanting more because we never feel truly satisfied, we never feel truly fulfilled. And that's a sad place to yeah. be because that's not the way we should be fucking living, I think. The whole world's going backwards where everybody, well, that's why drug abuse, alcohol abuse, mental yeah. health is on the rise because we, there's no blueprint or manual how we should be living life. We haven't got a fucking clue. That like, is it to be standing on stage in one in tournaments? Is it to be interviewing people that, like, is it to be an offer or is it to be a footballer? Because there's still something missing. We're always yeah. still craving more. Than I was like, so I've won the Mr. Olympia that I wanted to win. Not only that, I've set a new standard in the sport and now my career's over. It's over, mate. You've tore your bicep, it's over. You can't. So no shaman, no instructions, no nothing. And the night before, I was drinking vodka and doing lines of coke. <laughs> and I'm going to go and do I ask you in the jungle, right? <laughs> and I would rather die at 45, 50 years old having my name in the record books and having really achieved something with my life than to live a life like all these people around me. I live to a fucking hundred, but I don't achieve anything. I'll take option one. Boom, we're on. And we're on. Yes, we're we're live. <laughs> Six time Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, how are you, James? It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. We've been chatting back and forth for a bit, and uh, destiny brought me to Glasgow, and uh, here I am. First of all, brother, how are you? I'm good, mate. I've been on a um, pretty intense tour of the UK with my uh, nutrition brand, DY Nutrition, going around the gyms and uh, meeting the people, uh, training some lucky winners or unlucky as they might be, that's training with me. Uh, so it's been intense, and I'm finishing up here in, in Glasgow now with some coaching, and uh, looking forward to go back home. I'm living in Spain, so get back to the sun. I, haven't, I saw the sun this morning, and it's the first time I've seen the sun, I think, since about two weeks. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Scotland. Yeah, well, you know, Scotland, Birmingham, London, it was all pretty much the same in this this tour, you know? Mm -hmm. Sixth time Mr. Olympia, but yeah. there's more depth to you, there's more understanding of the brain not just the body but it's um you're quite a spiritual person i believe we're all spiritual we're all kind yeah. of searching no matter if it's want to win mr universe or be the biggest podcast on the planet like you're searching through something but we'll get into all that but i like to go back to the start of my guests where That's you grew it, up yeah, let's go back how to it all the, began. the roots where it began yeah yeah, yeah. um so yeah the, the the mr olympia quest it started when i was the thoughts started when I was young, at least. I always, I didn't know what it was. I just always felt I'm different from everybody else and I'm destined for something different. And that was a very strong feeling that I had, but I didn't, didn't know what it was. Um, 
until I came across bodybuilding. And um, I came across bodybuilding really the last year I was at school, so I was about 16. Um, was into martial arts originally. Not as it is now. I didn't have much martial arts with a karate and kung fu, so I was doing a bit of that. I came across uh, bodybuilding, the bodybuilding magazines, and uh, I was fascinated by it. And I was doing a little bit of training well, last year at school. And um, at 16, uh, my mom decided to move away from Birmingham, and uh, I decided to stay. I basically left home at 16, and um, it wasn't a lifestyle that was conducive to going to the gym or anything like that. So I didn't keep it up. Um, I uh, ended up in the detention center when I was, I think I was 19 when I went in there. And they had weights in there, so I was kind of reintroduced back to the weights. And 300 guys in there. Apparently, I was kind of like the strongest, fittest guy in there with the best natural physique. So, ah, this is it. But I, I didn't know where it was going to lead. I just knew this is something positive, and I don't want to go down this road. Uh, having your freedom taken away, I mean, it was a huge, huge shock for me. And I was like, I don't want to ever experience this again. So... Um, this is something that I'm good at. I love it, and it's something positive. And that was that was basically it. And it still took me time to, you know, even when I left the detention center, I had to get a job, I had to get somewhere to live, I had to get some stability in my life. And uh, then I said, right, on this day, I've got my job, I've got my apartment. Everything was like very um, planned out. I was already studying nutrition and bodybuilding as much as I could before I was even doing it. So I had a lot of information. I said, I'm going to start bodybuilding and I'm going to do competitions and something's going to come good from this. That's pretty much all as far as I thought at the start, you know. What was it like growing up in Birmingham? Uh, well, I grew up until I was 13. I grew up outside of Birmingham on a little small holding, a little farm. So we had some horses. My mum was a horse rider used to teach horse riding. I had my own pony. My sister had a pony with some dogs and cats and got ducks and little, you know, uh, wasn't a functional farm. I say a small holding. So it was quite idyllic kind of life, really. I lived on this farm with these animals. And uh, at 13, my dad uh, had a heart attack and he died. And that just changed everything. And... Um, then short after that, my mom met some another guy, and uh, he was from Birmingham. So we moved to Birmingham to totally from this to a totally different environment. Um, and I, I guess you know I was still upset, I was still angry, confused. My dad wasn't there, and uh, I don't know. I just felt like that wasn't really addressed by anyone around me. And uh, well, I do really well at school and all that stuff. And after that point I just, I just you know i just didn't see the point so i wasn't really interested in doing well at school um and when i left home at 16 um you know i was living on friends couches or whatever you know i didn't have stability and um you know at that point if you're a teenager you're either a punk a skinhead a mod or something like that so me and my friends were all skinheads and some friends were punks and uh that became kind of like, I guess that's what a gang is, right? It's a surrogate family that I felt, exactly. you know, my mates around me were, were family. So that became my family at the time. And, uh, yeah, I got I got sent to the detention center just for something silly. So it was nothing heavy. You know, we'd have a few drunken fights on the weekends and stuff like that. Um, but nothing, not like now with the kids carrying knives and guns all the time and stuff. It's just usually just some gang fights and fists and stuff like that so um it was you know it was totally different from my earlier childhood but i uh i blended in and uh became a city city guy i guess how much does your dad's death play a part were you alone be before like kind of on the farm nature kind of uh, distance from i was yeah because like um i lived on this farm and like my mates from school they lived on council estates so it was a bit different already that I lived on a farm and had a horse and my mum was from a very middle-class background. Her parents were both uh, teachers, music teacher, art teacher, and she had a very, you know, cut glass queen-like accent. So you had this posh mom and, 
you got horses and you live on a farm. So I was automatically different. And I didn't live next door to my mate. Uh, you know, if I want to go visit friends, it's two miles away. So walk or get on your bike. So it's very active. But I think I was, yeah, I was always very independent. I did strange things that now I look back and say, oh, that was, you know. But at the time, I didn't know it was unusual. I, like, you used to have bonfire night. I don't know if you remember. It's not PC to have bonfire night. But then bonfire night was a big thing. So I used to, I was like, 10 years old, got my horse, took my horse, used to chop down trees, tie all the trees on a rope to the horse, drag them back and build this massive bonfire all on my own. And then um, I started going to football, started going to Birmingham, football on the on the bus. 12 years old, I was going to the football on my own because I had no one to go with because the older lads wouldn't didn't want me hanging around. I was a kid, right? And the kids of my age wouldn't, be able to sneak off or they wouldn't get permission from their parents because you know going to a football match in those days it was it was a hairy thing so i was doing things like way ahead of everybody else but i, I just thought it was normal looking back now i think i yeah, just had a strong sense of independence i think from from day one do you feel you need to you needed to have that though after your dad died because you had to be the man of the house sort of thing i think there is a, there is a bit of that as well and um I think my mom didn't really know how to handle my loss. So her way of handling it was like, just let me do whatever I want. So there wasn't really any control. I just did pretty much what I wanted to do. Yeah. Was your, when you started bodybuilding, was that your escape? Uh, body, bodybuilding for me was um, like, I just looked at everything around me and I couldn't relate to it. I couldn't relate to the environment and people's lack of vision lack of ambition like get a job get a council house or get a house have some kids go to work eat shit breathe i'm like this is not for me there must be much more out there and just reading them bodybuilding magazines and reading about these guys in america and california on the beach and just a whole new world that i tapped into and i was like yeah um, maybe that's the way I can change my life. So I think the reason I was so focused from day one, and it would, you know, it's very easy to get distracted, especially when you're 20, 21 years old, which is when I started. All your mates are still going out. You've got girls to chase and all this stuff going on. Um, it wasn't a matter of I want to do this. It was literally I have to do this. It was something inside of me, almost like, it's, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's almost like I knew that I was going to be something different. I always knew, and then I got this thing, this is it. Um, but I didn't realize how far it could take me at that point. I wanted to win some competitions. Hey, maybe I, maybe I get my own gym or something like that and you know, make my own living, be independent. I didn't want to work for anybody else. Uh, tried a few, you know, when I was a teenager, and I'd just end up losing the job because I'd tell a guy to fuck himself because I didn't like the way he was talking to me. I didn't like any other male telling me what to do because I did, deep down I'm probably thinking you ain't my dad you don't tell me what to do mm -hmm. so I had that chip on my shoulder so um, I had to find a way to work for myself I couldn't work for anyone else and in the end that's you know I was able to be successful through bodybuilding and make my own way in society I remember feeling really pleased that I'm living next door to stockbrokers and uh, university lecturers and stuff like this and I'm this just big lump of muscle they, they didn't even know what I was doing, I was just a big guy at a gym, you know. What was it, seeing that you were in the detention centre, the majority of kids start that life of crime and never get out of it. What um, was going through your mind when you were in there? Did you value your freedom so much that you decided? It was, yeah, this? I was a free spirit, man. I've always been a free spirit. You know, I grew up on this little farm and I used to cycle everywhere and and walk and I uh, had no time, nobody telling me what to do. And, and in there you literally become a number. And uh, I wasn't a criminal. I was just a guy. I was just a kid that was, you know, being a teenager, getting drunk and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The worst things I ever did was get into a fight. You know, I didn't didn't steal from anybody. I wasn't a career criminal or anything like that. But some of the guys in there were. And uh, I've said it before, but I, there's one distinct uh, incident that I remember it was a lad from from Birmingham. I, I still see him around sometimes, and he's still in that life you know uh in and out of jail so 
one day one of the screws was like giving him a bollocking and saying, you better fix up, mate. You better change your attitude. Otherwise, you'll be in and out of jail all your life. And I said, so what? Do I give a fuck? I don't give a fuck. So I was like, I do. I do. This ain't for me. This place, I don't belong here. Um, actually, I, you know, while I was there, I got treated with a lot of respect from the, the the other lads that was in there, even the prison officers, because of the way I conducted myself and the fact I was very physical as well. So it served me well, but uh, I didn't ever want to go back there again. So I was determined on that. What was the first competition you entered? First, really, first competition I entered. Sometimes I even forget to mention it because uh, it wasn't like a real competition, I guess. You know, it was. Um, I was training at this gym in Birmingham on, on Temple Street that later I owned. I've come to own it and called it Temple Gym. But it was called Martin's Gym at the time because the guy called Martin was running it. So, uh, And Martin was um, it was a photographer. He used to work for the police uh, doing their photography, you know, crime scenes and all that. So he had all the photography equipment, and he was the gym owner because this was 1984. So people don't walk around with cameras. There's certainly no iPhones. So it was... Uh, Fortunate that he was there at that time and had a camera because he took pictures of me. Those are the first pictures ever taken of my physique, and I've been training for about eight, nine months, seriously, apart from bits I did when I was at school and bits I did in detention center that was serious training, and he, he's got those pictures. And he said, I've got a competition coming up in a few weeks. Mr. Birmingham, you know, just into gym, gyms from Birmingham. You should go in the first timers. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm not feeling really feel ready. And I, I don't know, I got um, I got flu or something. I couldn't train for a week. I didn't eat properly. But I looked in the mirror, I lost a few pounds, and I was like, shit, I look, I look a bit shredded. Like, that. you know what, I might as just step into this contest. So that was the only time that I ever did anything like being totally unprepared. But I um, went to Boots, got my uh, sudden tan, it was called. I put a coat of this. I thought I was looking really brown, but if I look at the pictures now, it's still white as a milk bottle. It was super white as a kid, you know, I had no color. Um, so I went in the first timers, and uh, and I won it, you know. And I was natural. I hadn't been training long, and the lads that I beat, you know, they are on a bit of juice and everything. So that was good. And I said, right, next year I'm going to do a proper, I'm going to go into a competition in the Federation. Um EFBB, it was called at the time. So that's the English version of the IFBB, which is the com federation that promotes Mr. Olympia and everything with all the... That's all the guys that I looked up to. They compete in the IFBB at the, at the pro level. So I said, all right, I'm going to go to this competition. Uh, novice competition. It's called Intermediates, but it's basically novice. Somebody that hasn't won a contest before. I'd like to win the qualifying round, and then I'd like to go to the British Championship later in the year in that class and... That's my goal. I want to be a novice British champion this year. Got it all planned out, everything. Went to the competition, came on stage, did my posing, came off the stage, and there's some judges and officials there all like waiting. Uh, one of them was Ron Davis, and Ron Davis was the head of the English Federation, but he was also judge at the Mr. Olympia. So this is a guy that knows, he knows the, you know, the sport inside out. Yeah? So it was Ron Davis and some other guys, and Ron said to me, where the, have you come from? I'm, like, I'm from Birmingham, mate. It's like, oh, what are you doing in this novice competition? I said, because I'm a novice, never competed before. Said, but nah, but you should be in the heavyweights. Uh, I, I don't think I'm good enough for the heavyweights, like in a year or two, yeah, but I'm a novice right now, practically laughing at me like this kid. It's not good enough. I said, listen, you're probably the best heavyweight we've got in the country right now. And like, couldn't really take it in, you know? Um, and he said, look, I want you to come and uh, do a trial next week for our team in the heavyweights to go compete in the World Games, which is a world championship. So I'm going, one weekend I'm do, being a novice competitor, and he's asking me to go in a world championship in a couple of weeks later. But, okay. And I remember, because I was doing a bit of work on the door, so I had no car. I had, I had nothing, man. I had an apartment with a, not much furniture in there and a mattress on the floor instead of a proper bed. All my money went to the training fees, bus fares, food, supplements. And 
by the time I'd done this contest, I was pretty much like I didn't have any money. So I even had to borrow money to go to the the trials, you know. Um, so I went to the trials, got picked for the British team, and went to the World Games and got seventh place there out of 13 guys, which, you know, for somebody who just started out, was pretty phenomenal. But I remember saying I was kind of talked into this. I wasn't ready because I wasn't ready to be able to have a chance of winning. So in the future, nobody's going to twist my arm. Um, I'm going to plan everything. I'm going to be in control of everything. I'm not going to compete in a contest unless I feel I've got a chance to win it. Um, but having said that, it was a great experience. Uh, people got to see me. I went on my first uh, paid guest appearance to Northern Ireland on a plane. I hadn't been on a plane before. Uh, all that. So this was the start of it. And uh, then I won the British Championship. Uh, I won the British Championship in 86, and that was a bit of... Um, I won the heavyweight class, but they didn't give me the overall championship. At that point, there was four weight classes. You have a winner from each weight class, and then they choose the overall, and he gets to be uh, pro status and compete as a pro. And um, I should have won that contest. Everyone pretty much knew that, but I didn't. It's a little bit of politics. Maybe because I was the guy that just didn't really speak to anybody, didn't try to kiss anyone's ass, just went to the gym and trained and turned up at the competition where other people were kind of in the clique or whatever. I don't know, but everything happens for a reason. If I'd have won at that point, I, I really wasn't ready to be a pro. So I'm philosophical about everything that happens. It's always happening for a reason. And uh, 1988, I won the heavyweight again and the overall and, you know, easily got my pro status. And uh, that was the end of my uh, amateur career in the UK. See, when it started opening doors, when you started getting flights and get, uh, getting away for the first time, was that when you realised, okay, I've got something here and oh, absolutely, you decided yeah. to give it everything? What happened is a um, uh, story. Like, 86, I won the, the British Championship, the heavyweight, but I didn't win the overall. 87, I had a, an injury. So I had surgery on my hip, little surgery on the hip because I had an injury. Um, well, something interesting happened to me. Uh, my doctor, because I told him, look, I'm doing these competitions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start taking steroids. Uh, and at first, he didn't want to do it because he thought I was a kid just messing about. But he saw me on the TV. I'm at the World Games, yeah? So now he's like, oh, I get it. Like, you're not messing about. So he said, look, I can't give them to you, but I'll check your blood and everything, make sure you're okay. Uh, so I went, and he said, I saw you on the TV. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm British champion now as well. He's like, ah, oh, this... Because he's a businessman as well as being a doctor. He's like, this gym business in the 80s, yeah, it was the new thing, right? It was just starting, right? It was just exploding. It's a good business, right, this gym business? I said, oh, I think so, yeah. He said, all right. He said, do you, would you like to open your own gym? I said, yeah, of course I would, yeah, but I don't have money. He's like, yeah, well, well, I've got the money. He said, so go try and find a premises for a gym. Tell me what you want for the gym. I'll buy all the equipment and you run it and we pay the overheads and then we split the profits 50-50. I said, sounds good. And he said, of course, it's a cash business. At the time, it, all, you know, it was, right? And you can steal from me if you want to and I'm not really going to find out. He said, but something about you, I know you won't do that. So the offer's on the table. I said, great, okay. So the guy that was in Temple Gym, Martin, I don't know what happened there, the story exactly, but he'd gone, so the building was vacant. And I knew this place well. It was right in the center of Birmingham, and it had a real you know, atmosphere. It was down these stairs in the basement. Um, it had been a gym there or a kung fu center or something for like 20 years. And I knew the guy that had the lease, so I managed to get hold of him. I said, I need to speak to you. He said, all right. So we had the conversation. I told him everything. He said, uh, okay. He said, you know me, Dorian. He said, oh, I've got so many businesses and I've been ripped off left, right and center all over the years. I know. He said, but something about you, I know you won't do that. So I want to give you the, it's, you can have the building, but you've got to do the deal with me. Exactly the same deal as the doctor offered you. I'm offering you the same and take the building. So that was, uh, that's how I got my first gym. So I was already, you know, starting to make a living now from, from bodybuilding. I was able to buy a car. 
Uh, I could drive a car at 11 years old. My dad taught me to drive, but I didn't have one until I was 25 because I didn't have any money. It was all going into this, into the bodybuilding. So I got the gym in 87. I was starting to do appearances. Um, I got my first sponsorship from a British company. Uh, and the guy was very nice. Uh, the guy's passed on now, Dave McInerney. He had a company in Birmingham called Tropicana. And he said, look, I'm going to give you a sponsorship contract. You help me advertise my products. Um, but I know you're going to do well when you go to America and you'll probably get better opportunities. So if you do, we'll run it till then. And, you know, if you want to want to leave, you can leave. So there was a few people along the way that, that helped me. But yeah, I was when it became British Championship, I got the gym, I was doing appearances. So it was already changing my life in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. well, there was more to come, you know. How is the transition once you start winning competitions like for your training and you want to be the best on the planet? How did you see the rise in your training and your to be the best? I believe you've got to make sacrifices. You've yeah. got to become as a lonely journey, and you people maybe not see that. But for you, like, what was the transitions to to be the best and go to the top? Like, how did that up your training, your food, and more detail to everything you were putting into your body? It was like from day one, I was giving it a hundred percent i've got every workout even from that first workout that i did in 1983 i've got it written down every every workout written down every um you know changes in diets supplements things like that when i started taking steroids what i'm taking measurements very analytical got this uh, going all the way back to the start so i was always giving 100 percent of what i could give but when you've got a sponsorship and you've got income coming in, of course you can put more into it because you don't have to go, to, you know, when I was starting, I was doing hard manual labor and then I was doing security on the doors. So this all takes a bit of time and energy. Uh, when you start making money from the sport, um, then you can put even more energy into it because you don't have anything else. I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have to go to a job, didn't have to do anything, but you've got to have an absolute tunnel vision to be the best in anything, I think. It was a sport or a business or anything. You've got to have that tunnel vision. So I had that from the start, but I was able to maybe put more into it as I went along because I had more time, basically. I didn't have to spend time doing other things. I had income coming in. And um, the ironic thing is, like, when you're starting out and you really need the help, you don't get any, and nobody really understands. What, nobody really understood what I was doing. Even my girlfriend or or anyone that was around me didn't understand what you're doing here is a bit strange. Why are you eating every three hours? Why are you doing this? Why are you just you're not you don't want to go out. You don't want to do anything. You're just doing this. This is a bit obsessive. Why are you doing this? When you start to get successful and win contests and get accolades and get covers on the magazines, everyone's like, ah. Oh, Okay, and now they start to get a bit behind you. And the more successful you are, the more support you get, the more money you get. Um, but at the start, you get nothing, you know, so yeah. you've got to really believe in yourself. you always got to believe in yourself, but the start is the hardest because nobody really understood what I was doing or believed that I could do it until I, bam. Fortunately, quite early on, I was successful. So it's, it's kind of, you've either got it or you haven't in bodybuilding. Yeah, because nobody else sees your vision. So no. with the majority of people being so weak, people speak them out their visions because they think, nah, it's just a crazy idea. But everybody's got life-changing ideas, like world-changing ideas that like people are just... Yeah, you've got to put them into action, them. though. You know, everything yeah. that you think and you focus on, you can come to reality if you really focus on it enough. It's just hard, especially if your environment's not conducive and other people around you have got a totally different vision. It takes real strength... Uh, of character and single-mindedness to just keep on pushing through and believing in yourself but that's yeah. what it takes how hard was it to be a bouncer and getting paid buttons but you still had that vision to be the best on the planet was that difficult putting your life on the line because back then 80s and stuff nobody fucked about in the doors and bouncers no. gave good beatings out as well well fortunately um i worked in let's say nice places yeah so um was that a strategy that you wanted because you yeah i mean listen i'm just here to earn some money man I'm not here because mm -hmm. i want to be a tough guy or i want to get into fights or anything maybe it happens and you're going to deal with it but um i worked in 
kind of quite trendy wine bars. They were wine bars were the thing at the time, and um, so uh, my policy that I was taught by somebody that taught me is like, if you see somebody that you think is going to be a problem, you just don't let them in. You just stop them there. If you're going to have a confrontation, better have it like on the steps, on the door. If they're inside, it's a much bigger problem. You got to get them out then. So, and um, it was a certain clientele that the, you know, the owner's looking for. So it's kind of a bit like a fashion police, you know, like, no, you, you can't, you, you're not suitable, you're not suitable. So I didn't really have too much uh, problem with that kind of crowd. The only one time I worked on a nightclub and there was a huge, uh, huge riot in there. And uh, one of the bouncers got stabbed, nearly died and all this stuff. And I said, screw this. I don't know what I was getting at the time. 20 quid a night or something at the time it's definitely not worth it but it was i knew it was a temporary thing you know that uh, at some point i knew i'm going to get out this is just pocket money for a while just to help me pay the bills and so on yeah and when i got the gym uh <clears throat> then of course i didn't have to do that anymore gym was doing quite well back in the 80s um small bodybuilding gyms who we were making decent money because you didn't have all the big commercial gyms you have now so i was doing okay with that and then the sponsorship. So I think I did the doors for about a year and a half, two years maximum. It's not a long time to make you realize you don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, I never, you know, started doing the doors thinking this is a good career option. It's just, uh, it's it was a better option than, than the physical work I was doing because it was quite draining. Um, doing the physical work, construction and uh, stuff like that. So, I could do three or four nights on the doors and it will be enough to, you know, to get by for now. I knew something was around the corner. So it was just a stopgap for me, really. Yeah. So when you got your pro license, did you enter the Mr. Olympia, was it 91? Uh, no. So you get your pro uh, status just for people that don't know how it works. Um, to compete in professional contests, not, not something you can choose to, oh, well, I'd like to, no, you've got to go through the ranks. So, it's changed now, and uh, they're giving out pro status much more easily now. Uh, at that point, you but you basically got to be the best guy in your country on that year, and one person. Then you get your pro status. You can compete as a professional. But then, as a professional, you've got to go in a pro show and get in a top three, mostly, um, to qualify for Mr. Olympia. So Mr. Olympia is basically the best of all the professional bodybuilders in that year, uh, Joe Weider uh, came up with the Mr. Olympia for that reason. Who is the best single professional bodybuilder on the planet this year? That's Mr. Olympia. That's undisputed. Everyone accepts that. So, But even if you're a professional, you can't just enter into the Mr. Olympia. You have to qualify by being top three uh, in a pro show. There was a couple of them, Knight of Champions and the Arnold Schwarzenegger show, where they would accept top five. So, um, my first pro show was Night of Champions in New York, and that was a top five uh, qualify for Mr. Olympia. And I put myself under a bit of pressure at this point. I don't know if I really even told anybody, but I made the vow to myself that if I don't place in the top five of this contest, then that's it. I won't compete anymore because of all the sacrifice that goes into it and because you're also let's be honest, or bodybuilding, you're using chemicals. It's not just bodybuilding, it's many sports, but highly competitive sports, people do whatever they can do to win. That's very... Um, so there's risks that's come along with that. So I'm not going to... And I observe people around me. You know, they neglected their job. They neglected their family. They had no social life. They spent all the money on bodybuilding, but they weren't going anywhere. It was, it was a waste, yeah? So I didn't want to be one of those guys and... Uh, I had a young son, uh, and a girlfriend, and they lose time with you. They lose focus. Uh, all these things, I say, right, if I don't make it, if I don't get in the top five, I'm not good enough to be one of the best because I look at the history of bodybuilding, and you've either got it or you haven't. When people come along like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Lee Haney or any of the champions, it's, it's apparent from, you know, they're going to be, might not win the first contest, but they'll be second or third. You can tell they're going to go somewhere. So uh, fortunately, I got second in that first show. So, okay, you know. 
Uh, if I hadn't gotten the top five, I would have not stopped training because I love to train, love bodybuilding, but I probably would have opened more gyms or something like that and have more time and more focus to do that and spend time with a family and, and so on. But I got second, so uh, um, I didn't go to Mr. Olympia that year because I wanted to put a bit more time in. So I went back to that same contest the following year, 91, and I won it. Night Champions won that, and I went to the Mr. Olympia to keep, compete against Lee Haney, who was basically Mr. Olympia when I started training. So the whole time I'm coming up, here's Mr. Olympia, and now I'm going to compete against him. And I had to change my mindset from being a bit of a fan to being like, I want to try and beat this guy. Uh, so that required a change of mindset. Yeah. So see, when you go, a kid from England, one of the first ever, like, being an outsider, were you were you used to that? Did that make you feel okay? I'm out because they call you the shadow for a reason. You used to show up yeah, one yeah. and then disappear. But did that play? Did that help you a lot from being a kid and being away from everybody? That going over there, it's all the Americans, it's all glitz and glamour. Yeah, I, I think so because even in the British scene, I was an outsider. I never tried to be anything else because I'm just me. I'm not being purposely antisocial or or anything like that. It's just me. Yeah, so I can only be how I am I never want to try and be anything else so I was already used to being a bit of the outsider anyway and just coming up and doing my thing and uh, I was told by a lot of people when I went to America that I'll, you won't do well because it's a lot of politics and you need to know uh, the right people and you need to have your pictures in the magazines otherwise they're not going to know who you are and that's going to affect your results and nobody in America knows who you are you've been in a couple of British magazines but over there it's nothing they don't, they don't know who you are and I just said, you know what, I, I just don't listen to any of this, yeah? I think if you're good enough, people have to see it and people have to recognize it. So I'd be so bloody good that, you know, they can't do that. And uh, I went and I got close, close second in that first one. But yeah, being backstage and all that, all the guys know each other, right? Because they're used to competing to each other, so they're all talking to each other, and I'm there in a the corner on my own. But I don't mind because... My only statement I need to make is stand on the stage. And that's my statement. There's my work. I've done all this. I've created this. And I don't need to say anything. It's there. What was it like when you got the second, like just showing up, nobody really knew who you were, and yeah. then competing against one of the greatest of all time? Like, what did Haney win it? Like seven, eight in a row? Like, yeah. I got, um, at that point when I competed against Haney, and I got second in night champions, come back the next year, won it. At that point, people were recognizing and saying, hey, this guy uh, <clears throat> is more or less the same height as Haney, more or less the same size. We've never seen anyone that can stand next to Lee Haney with, with the size and, and everything. So people were already saying, you know, we could uh, maybe have a chance by that point. Um, and I really went there to try to win, you know, with the greatest respect to the Lee Haney as champion. But I had to go there with that mentality and try and win so uh three rounds of judging i won one he won two so it was the first time that ever happened that he'd been beaten in a round um so you could say it was reasonably close um for my debut of course i wanted to win but i, I was happy with the second to lee haney at that point what did you do differently that year to then go and win it uh the next year well Lee Haney had announced his retirement, so... Do you think that's because he knew you were coming? He'd got eight Mr. Olympias, right? So he's now got the record. So I'm not saying that my presence was solely what made his decision. But he's got eight, right? He's got the record. Most Mr. Olympias ever. And this guy that just got second to me, he's coming up. He's going to continue to improve. Where i am been here eight times, Mr. Olympia, and the eighth one, he pulled out all the stops to be as good as he could. I know because I spoke to the guy that trained with him. He said, mate, he, he definitely knew you were coming, and he you know, he put an extra effort that year because he knew he had a real challenge on his hands. So, I mean, what's to gain the next year? If he beat me, he would get nine. He'd still be a record holder, but if he lost... It kind of taints taints the the record, right? So nothing particularly to gain and everything to lose. So why do it? You know. Um, 
So it was probably a factor in his in his decision. Yeah. See, when you win that, how hard is it then to stay two feet in the ground? I'd imagine everybody wanted yeah. your attention. You got all the bullshitters of the day, all the liars, everybody promising you the world. But you'd already done it yourself anyway. For help with a couple of people along the way, like no doubt yeah. your character, you always be grateful for that. But how hard is it to stay focused and stay? I don't want to just one one. I want more, and you become greedy towards it. But how hard is that for the outsider to then become very popular, not just in the UK but America? Yeah. Well, um, to answer the f the question about the first win, what did I do differently? wasn't really like I did anything different. I was continuing to do what I, I was doing, but I was still developing because I hadn't been really training that long. So I was still developing. And I knew Lee Haney wasn't there. So I knew my competition was coming for a few guys. Um, Lee Labrada, Sean Ray, Vince Taylor, who were smaller than me. So I said, I, I got even bigger that year, but I said, you know what? I don't mind sacrificing a bit of size to come in like super razor sharp because these smaller guys are sharp, razor sharp. So if I can be bigger, much bigger than them and match them on the condition, they've got no chance. So I kind of came down a bit in body weight less than I could have displayed on stage that year to be super shredded. And uh, that was the outcome. And uh, the next year was when I made the real big breakthrough because I was keeping notes. I was taking pictures every week. I was analyzing what I'm doing. I said, okay, look at 92, my first win. About six weeks out, you're in shape, mate. You're in shape, but you lost another 15 pounds because you wanted to get sharper and sharper. You got a little bit sharper, but what you did, you just basically cannibalized muscle tissue. You lost muscle those last few weeks. So next time, don't do that. So next time, I came in from 240, 242, in 92 to 257, 258. So as a Mr. Olympia winner, coming in 15 pounds, 16 pounds heavier the next year is totally unheard of. But it's because I was still learning. Uh, yeah, you must have found some magic drug or something that year. I didn't do anything different chemically than the year before. I just managed my nutrition better and didn't sacrifice my muscle tissue. And 93, then it was like, this guy has set new standards for bodybuilding. He'll never be beaten and all this stuff. Um, and yeah, there's huge demand on your time. I had a contract with Weeder, with the Weeder Publishing. They did Flex Magazine, Muscle and Fitness. Uh, and Weeder would like me to be moving out to California. There's more opportunities out there, all this stuff. And I was tempted and I just kind of wrestled with it back and forth. But I said, if I'm out there in California, Weeder can call on me on my time. Can he do this? Can he go here? Can he go? And I'm under contract, so I can't really say no. So that will take some time away. And then, you know, there's a whole scene out there. There's parties, there's girls, there's this, there's that. I said, you know what, better I stay here in Birmingham with the people I know, training in the gym that I trained in as an amateur, keep my feet on the ground and minimize distractions because how I got there in the first place is by total tunnel vision, dedication, and just training and eating and sleeping i want to continue doing that and it'll be difficult to do that and then of course yeah um everyone loves you right yeah. and i was naive enough to believe it like everyone loves me because i'm such a great guy and i'm such a successful guy and everyone loves me because they love no they don't fucking love you they're around you because it's good for them and what they can take from you and i had to learn this lesson over and over again until i kind of got it you know yeah see when you you're in america you win that for the first time see coming back do you feel see when you says at the start as well that you wouldn't you don't like working for anybody you just tell them to fuck off yeah. the part of that help you make that decision as well because you thought he could maybe phone you at any time and then yeah absolutely that demand. was it and um i'm almost impossible to manipulate like people try but and you know, if you're number one, you can do it, right? You've got the you got the power to say no if you're number one because you're number one, right? So uh, there's a funny story I tell, but it's you know people are always trying to pull you in this direction and that direction, and I just be like stubborn. I'm very stubborn. I'll just be like no. Um, so the weed are publishing. There was no internet then, you know. So how do you get your information about bodybuilding? Was the magazines? And somehow it was a bit more. I don't know what's the word. 
romantic or something. You, you wait. You're waiting for that magazine to come into W.A. Smith. Is it there today? No, it's not there today, but there tomorrow. And you're excited to get that magazine because there was that lack of information. You only got the magazines coming to look at your, who won the contest, how does this guy train? Now you got the internet. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, I, I just decided um, to keep my feet on the ground. So Joe had the two magazines. He had the Flex magazine, which was primarily bodybuilding, and he had Muscle and Fitness, which is a bit more mainstream. So Flex Magazine, I've already been on the cover of that several times because it's all hardcore and weights and grunting and sweating. So he wanted me to do one for Muscle and Fitness. And Muscle and Fitness was always a bodybuilder and a model, female model, you know, regular skinny model because to appeal to the mainstream, yeah? So it's, you know, you're all there. So I'm doing this shoot with a model and it's like they take a picture. It's like, so Joe Weed is like, Dorian, you smile. Wow. I was try, trying. I can't. I just couldn't do this. I just couldn't do a false smile. I mean, yes, nice. you asked me to smile for a camera now. I can do it, but then I couldn't do it. Huh? And um, so he's trying everything to get me to smile, you know, get the model, get my wife. And in the end, he's just, you know, he's aspirated and he's just like, ah, just let this guy do what he wants. So that's how it all turned out. In the end, people just give up. It's just like, he's going to do what he wants. So just let him do it. See, when you got your first one, what was the feeling? Like for myself, I'm always wanting more. I'm never satisfied. I never feel complete. Yeah. And sometimes I question that. Am I just being greedy and not showing gratitude? But for yourself, when you're wanting, when you, you achieve a goal that you've set out, did you, ever, did you ever feel satisfied? Or was it just straight back into the gym and, and nah, straight back on the gym I, there I again? never felt satisfied. Not that I was unsatisfied with a lot of shit and don't look good. It was more like a mission that I was on. So now I've got to be Mr. Olympia. Now I've got to be Mr. Olympia and recognized as the best Mr. Olympia ever up to this point, the most muscle and condition and everything like that, set a new standard. So where do I go from here? And a lot of people told me, maybe they're, in a way, they're smarter people than me. They're like, mate, you just, all you need to do now, stop this mad, crazy, heavy training you're doing, cruise, yeah? Cruise on your training, earn the money, do the appearances, go here, earn the money, cash in, cash in, cash in. You don't need to push it anymore because where you are is like nobody can get that for years anyway, so just maintain. And uh... But I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in, like, can I get better? Like, you know, anybody, there's any a martial artist, a runner, whatever, it's like, can I get faster? Can I get better? That's what's driving you, not the money. The money is good that you're now making a living at what you love and enjoy doing, but it's the drive, it's the passion. You always want to see if you can get bigger or faster or whatever it is that you're doing. You want to push the envelope, and that's what I wanted to do. And uh, in doing that, somehow I, you know, I got injured because I was just pushing all the time and not giving myself a break. Uh, I got injured near to a contest because now what I realize and what I teach people if I'm helping them now, when you're getting ready for a contest and you're on that contest diet and your body fat's getting lower and lower and you may be a little dehydrated and you're for sure you're a little bit exhausted and tired um, and you really don't sleep well when you're on a contest diet because you have an, an internal alarm clock basically when you go to sleep and your blood sugar drops too low because you're really hungry, there's an alarm bell goes off in your head and said, wake up, wake up, because you're starving and you need to eat. So you wake up and so your sleep's broken, you're more exhausted, you're more vulnerable to injury because of all those factors. Um, so I advise people now to kind of back off the intensity and the weights a little bit going into the contest to try and avoid injury. So that's the one thing that I really learned and I would change. Um... I wouldn't go back and change it because everything happens for a reason, as I said. Even my injuries happen for a reason. It's, I, I tore my tricep tendon on my last Mr. Olympia just three weeks before in 97. And I had surgery. I tried to recover. I couldn't. And then I had to you know, announce my retirement. And still didn't really hit me until like the next year. And it's like, what am I doing now? Who am I? What's the point to life? I've been so deep into this, so 
every ounce of my soul going into this, and now it's over. And what do you do? And who are you? And it's just a whole crisis. Uh, depression, uh, that's very common with retired athletes because you lost that you lost that high. It's a drug. You, you haven't got it anymore. And, and where are you going and what you're doing? And this opened up a whole avenue of me searching, soul searching, and that all happened for a reason, uh, and which I can see now. But at the time, you don't know that. You don't want to be there. It's like it feels like hell, you know? Yeah, you look at boxers, footballers, when they kind of retire or injury forces them out, like they can't handle that. Do you think that's part of, with the exercise as well, when you've got your serotonin, your endorphins, yeah. your dopamine, the natural chemicals, can you enjoy them? See if when you're bang on the gear and you're training like that, you're under eating, can you, do you still get a natural high or do you just feel tired constantly? You get a natural high from the exercise and you can always do that, yeah? Unless you, you know, some reason you can't exercise because you're injured or something. So you can always get that chemical high and, I think a lot of people, it maybe came um, even more when they had this lockdown bullshit and the gyms were closed and people couldn't go to the gym. I mean, the depression started kicking in because a lot of us are going to the gym to get that, you know, raise the body, the chemicals and avoid that uh, falling into that depression. And when it's not there anymore, people are falling into depression. So, uh, but you can still exercise, but you haven't got the high of this competition that in itself is a high that you're pushing yourself and you've got this single goal it's like you're looking down a tunnel at something and that's not there anymore that your life mission is now over so what do you do now that's that's the question and uh some of us have a hard time answering that some's harder than others but it's very common yeah, as you know uh and I know it's is what if people go to a drug, what do they go to when they're ex sports people? Very often they go to cocaine because maybe it's somehow mimicking that high that you get from this life mission you're on. I'm not quite sure, but it seems to be quite common. And I had my little, you know, yeah, but go sh- with that and different things as well. Yeah, but as humans, we kind of always want, we're always searching that. No matter what it is naturally, chemically, like we're just yeah. always wanting more because we never feel truly satisfied, we never feel truly fulfilled. And that's a sad place to yeah. be because that's not the way we should be fucking living. I think the whole world's going backwards where everybody why well, it's why drug abuse, alcohol abuse, mental yeah. health is on the rise because we, there's no blueprint or manual how we should be living life. We haven't got a fucking clue. That like, is it to be standing on stage in one in tournaments? Is it to be interviewing people that like, is it to be an offer or is it to be a footballer? Because there's still something missing. We're always yeah. still craving more. Than there's a hole inside. And yeah, trying constantly. To fill it. I mean, I'd, I'm 60 next year. I feel like, I feel quite comfortable with myself. I feel like I'm kind of getting to that place. Content? Yeah, I, I, I feel so. But it's, it's taken a long time, you know. But I mean, what is time anyway? I mean, and we're all here. We're all here. I believe we're all here. We're all spirits. So you say some people are spiritual, some not. No, we're all spirits, whether you're aware of it or not. That's the different case, yeah? But we're all spirits coming here and having an experience in a physical form. That's that's what I believe. And uh, we're here to learn lessons. And normally the lessons you learn is in the hard times. When everything's all good and all balanced and uh, everything you don't really learn so much because you're not getting challenged it's it's the challenges in life that <clears throat> that make you grow but it's fucking uncomfortable while it's happening and you, and you don't want it to happen you don't want to be there but later you can look back and say you know i got through that and i learned some things and i'm now a stronger and better person for that so maybe i should be grateful for those experiences even though they weren't pleasant at the time yeah being uncomfortable in the test in life is where your growth is that's where you'll learn from that like, you don't learn being a winner all the time you don't learn if you're positive and happy all the time that doesn't exist anyway it's not a twitter no 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 that's, that exists on instagram yeah life. fake life <laughs> do you know what i mean like uh, we can all post for good life but yeah we don't impose the other well i, I try to share with life. people some of the challenges and things i've been through and uh uh 
that helps them because they're looking up to me for whatever reason. And uh, just say, oh, even this guy I look up to, even his like been there in the depths and, and has managed to climb out and I might fall in there again. I don't know, you know, but uh, the thing is you will get through it. Yeah. You will get through it, you know, but it's not fun at the time. But when you get through it, then you'll, you'll be stronger. It's just like a workout, you know, it's a stress, right? But your body gets stronger from that. And uh, if you look, we were talking earlier about Wim Hof, it's like the ice is a stress, the cold's a stress, training's a stress, going in the sauna is a heat stress, but all those things are beneficial for your, for your physical body. And it's kind of the same for your mind, I think. You have mm. to go through stuff to, to learn and to make it stronger, otherwise you'll just be complacent and comfortable. Yeah, what's the lowest points when you're in competition, when you're getting into competition, what's the, the lowest points you get to? Is it a week before, a month before, or... What's the, the, the one where you had to write low and you write, you, you need to say to yourself, okay, I need to push through because of what you're trying to achieve? I never really lacked motivation, but I think that getting ready for a contest, the hardest part for me was kind of in the middle. Uh, as I'm talking about contest preparation where you're reducing your body fat and you're reducing your calories, you're doing more cardio and everything like that. I mean, off-season training, getting big and strong, love it, no problem. All day long, I'll do that. Um, but really, for a competition, at first, it's fairly easy because I'm, you know, it's a new phase. Right, I'm getting ready for a competition now, so you know, I'm looking forward to it. And your body starts, you start losing water, start losing fat, start looking better in the mirror. It's great, it's great, it's great. I found the middle period when I was about seven, six weeks out. So it's not at the start. You're not near to the con. It's in the middle. It's probably the hardest part because the last two or three weeks you're on. You're on the home run. You can see it. There, there's the the contest is here. It's around the corner, and we're nearly ready now. And we're going to get there. So in the middle was uh, was really the hardest. And for me, the diet is hard, man. Because you you know all your signals, all your body's telling you that you should be eating, and you've got to override that or constantly override it until. I mean, I used to dream about food all the time because my brain's asking for it. And it's like you're in a fight with yourself. Nope, you can't have that because the goal, the goal, the goal is greater than your discomfort. So you're going to fucking push through it, mate. You know you signed up for this. So just keep going, you know? Yeah. I still watched one of your videos and I think you had a dream about sausages. And yeah, you yeah, yeah. I woke up and panicking. <laughs> <laughs> Sweating. Like, uh, don't even have any fucking sausages in the house. So I couldn't eat them. But, you know, in the dream it happened. Because... Uh, I think your body's is probably craving for fat. You know, it's a sausage full of fat, isn't it? So we used to believe in those days that fat was bad and you had to have a really low fat. Now, I mean, I know more more information, new uh, information about nutrition now, and fats are not bad at all. In fact, the carbohydrates are more damaging than, than fats are. So we've been sold a whole lot of bullshit, you know, from... 30, 40 years ago when they told everybody fat's causing heart disease and fat is bad for you and really it's not, it's sugar. Mm -hmm. See when you, to win six, did you feel pressure every year? Did it get more every year or did it get easier because you knew exactly what you were doing now? Every year was different. You know, the first one was the first one and that's like breaking through to you. The, you know, I had a little bit of struggle. I, I got second to Lee Haney uh, so my whole career, I'm like, I'm this fucking street cred from Birmingham, and and, and you're not going to be able to keep me down, and I'm going to come, and I'm the underdog, and I got that drive, and I got that hunger because I'm the underdog. Then I got second to Lee Haney, I want to beat him, and I'm the underdog, and I'm going to beat this guy from America, and and then when I won, now I'm the guy, right? I can't be the underdog anymore. So and, and getting ready for that, the first one just before I won it, I was really struggling. It's like, so I'm actually the favorite for this. So I'm not the underdog anymore. And, and I had a real mental struggle. Like, so you're probably going to win this. So I'm really going to be Mr. Olympia, the whole dream of every bodybuilder. I'm going to achieve that. Me, little me. And I was like, why fucking not you? Somebody's got to do it. And let's be honest, is, is anybody working harder than you? Is anybody more dedicated to this sport or this thing, whatever you're doing, is it? No, no, it's not. You can't. 
can't be. So then you fucking deserve it, mate. Go on, you can do it. So I had to have this conversation. So that was the first one that I won. The second one was like, I've smashed everything now. I smashed every record. And the third one, I wanted to go even further, but I got injured on the third one six weeks out. So then there's a totally different challenge. Well, I, I tore my bicep and for a day or two, I was like, so I've won the Mr. Olympia that I wanted to win. Not only that, I've set a new standard in the sport and now my career's over. It's over, mate. You've tore your bicep, it's over. You can't. Uh, you're wrestling with it. And then I started getting on top of it and saying, okay, so if you're going to say it's over now, it's over, right? But what if you keep training? If your training's compromised a little bit, it's compromised. But keep doing whatever you can do. Keep on your diet. Because if you come off your diet now and blow it, it's... It's over, right? So easy to say, fuck it, I got injured and let's have a beer and let's have pizza and fuck, I'm depressed. And I didn't, I, I was tempted, but I didn't. No, 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 don't give up now. Do whatever you can do right up to the contest. And if it's not good enough, you can always drop out a week before. But if you drop out now, it's, it's finished, right? So I did that, I did that and uh, got through to the contest and won it, but it wasn't ideal and I wasn't in my best shape. So the next year is like, I fucking need to redeem myself because I was injured last year and wasn't my best shape. So this year I need to bring it. And certain people were saying negative things and I was just like, okay, give me that. Or I'll, I'll show you. So it was always, I always worked on that fuel, like I'll fucking show you. It's the whole world, you know, since I was a kid, I had this attitude, I'll show you. Tell me I can't do something. It's like guaranteed I'm going to go do it, you know? Um, so 95 was the third one and that was debatable uh, people debate whether that's my best shape or 93 so that was 95 96 was a different challenge um the whole contest was um drug tested for diuretics not for steroids but for diuretics because that? diuretics are um drugs that make you lose water you know they're made for medical reasons people retaining water or whatever so like insulin uh, not insulin no. insulin is uh regulates your blood sugar it's a storage hormone uh, diuretics is uh, it just flushes water out of your body and that was banned it was banned because people were abusing them and there was a few deaths I mean if you lose too much water and you lose too many electrolytes which regulates your heartbeat you can have a heart attack so a few people had died getting ready for a contest using diuretics as a quick weight loss uh, thing I never really used it that much but Last couple of days before a contest, I'd use something mild just to make sure I wasn't holding any excess water. Uh, so 96, they, you know, they said, we're going to test for this because it's getting dangerous for people, so we want to make sure people are not using diuretics. Um, so <clears throat> because I knew the guys relied on diuretics, a lot of them I didn't, so they probably wouldn't be in great shape. So I wanted to be like super shredded. So I came down a little bit too light for that one. Uh, so every year was different, and the last year was... A nightmare because I tore my tricep tendon three weeks before the contest and I wasn't able to train at all. And I had the same conversation again, but because I'd experienced it, the conversation before, like, mate, you've been here before. Yeah, but it wasn't so bad last time because it was six weeks out and it was a muscle tear and this is a tendon detachment. You can't even train. How can you compete in Mr. Olympia? Well, I've been training all year round. I've been on my diet. So if I can't train for three weeks, how much difference is it going to make? I don't know. Let's, let's find out. Um, and 97 is controversial that some people think I shouldn't have won. I, I think I should have, but it was the closest one and I was not in the best shape and I was not mentally in the right place because of the injury. And I was still had inflammation, I still had pain, uh, all this stuff. So I was not my usual powerful, confident self uh, going into the competition. Mm -hmm. See, when how extreme it can be when people are dying how does that affect you going into competition did you ever question it like fuck me like what i'm doing here is basically life or death especially with the the food intake and the exercise and the steroids like or were you just so focused on like i don't care if i die i just want to show the world that i'm the best that's ever been well first of all i think i was a bit more knowledgeable maybe a bit more cautious than some people so i was not um really a user of strong diuretics 
uh, obviously using steroids, growth hormone, all that stuff. And I always accepted that that could have some negative health consequences. And I, uh, I compare it to smoking. We all know smoking's not good for you. But if you smoke for five years and you give it up, or you smoke for 10 years and give it up, you might be okay. If you smoke for 20, 30 years, we all know what's going to happen, right? So I was always telling myself, I'm using steroids and growth hormone, etc., because it's a tool of my trade. And for me to compete on an even field, I've got to use it. So decide yes or no. And I decided yes at the start, but knowing all this, and I'm only going to do it for a period of time. Uh, this is not going to be, I'm not going to be doing this for too long. So I was aware of the potential risks, although I was never going to put myself in a position where I could have a heart attack or something like that by using diuretics. Although I did have a problem back in 86 when I didn't know what I was doing, I took a diuretic and I started cramping really severely. So that could have been more serious than it was. And that was just out of pure ignorance. Um, but as far as like the attitude of people that are in professional bodybuilding, and this would go, I would say this would go across any sport. Because there's a guy called Goldman, uh, Dr. Goldman. He did a survey on athletes, bodybuilders, different athletes. If you could, uh, if I give you a pill now that would guarantee you a gold medal in the Olympics or equivalent in your sport, guarantees you that, but you'll die at 45, would you take it? I think it was like 70% said yes, I would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fucking hell. So that's the attitude, mate. That's the attitude. The fucking highly competitive individuals otherwise they wouldn't get there in the first place well um, they die at a young age just to get that goal they finished yeah because when you when you're young and you're doing this thing you're not really thinking about when you're thinking about forever yeah. you, you know you, you feel indestructible as well when you're 25 30 years old like i think i had a conversation with my girlfriend when i first started i said i'm doing a competition and you know i'll take some of this uh steroids people didn't know too much about it then but she's like i've heard them a bad fear and like I said, I don't think so, because look at all, you know, it can't be that bad. Look at all the guys, they're all they're okay, Schwarzenegger, everybody, they're, you know, they're all right. And she said, yeah, but what about when you get older? What if you're like, you know, 45, 50 years old and you die? I'm like, I don't give a fuck about 45, 50 years old. Yeah. I'm doing what I'm doing now, yeah? And I would rather die at 45, 50 years old having my name in the record books and having to really achieve something with my life than to live a life like all these people around me. I live to a fucking hundred, but I don't achieve anything. I'll take option one. But fortunately, it didn't happen. Here I am still, I'm okay, you know, and I'm, I'm really in a different phase of life where I'm very conscious about my health and really looking after my health. Um, that's my mission now, not to have big muscles. I couldn't care less now. It's not what I need. And in order to think like that, you have to give up the ego as well. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a, a bodybuilder and everyone treats you in a certain way because you're this big guy, right? A lot of guys don't want to give that up because it's, it's their identity. Yeah. And they feel that they will be treated differently and people view them differently if they're not that guy anymore. But carrying a lot of body weight whether it be muscles or or otherwise mm -hmm. it's not really good for you as you're getting older you know your, your body changes it can't handle the stress and just carrying around like 18 19 20 stone in your 50s or uh, again your 60s it's not good for you the body right. seems to adapt to anything you put in it it always wants more so see if you abuse steroids and take more and more and more would you get bigger and bigger and bigger or would you just have a plateau there's a you know there's a certain point when the, you, you put the water in a glass you can get to the top after that it's just spilling out right so there's the same thing with steroids a certain you might get better results taking more to a certain point and at that point it's not you're not going to get anything more out of it but you're going to get more negatives the more you know the longer you take it and the more you take the more possibility is that you're going to get negative effects how is it when you see like Ronnie Coleman and like you, see, you watch the, the his documentary was at Netflix? Yeah, yeah. And you sure. watch it and you kind of think, "Fuck me!" Like you kind of feel sad as well. Like obviously he lived the life that he wanted, <clears throat> he got the results that he wanted. But I, you know, I, I look at Ronnie and I think it must be tough to be to be like that. 
you know, especially as he being so active. But credit to Ronnie. He's, he's handling it well. He's, he's laughing and he's smiling and he seems to be okay. And uh, maybe it's the same thing as I was just saying. Ronnie Coleman is eight times Mr. Olympia. He did an amazing thing with his life. And uh, people won't forget that. He, you know, his name will go on forever. So maybe he figures that's a price that was worth paying. Um, and, you know, I've been stubborn myself in the training. It's just push, 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 because that's, that's the nature of a champion. But it can become self-destructive at some point. And you've got to know when to change lanes, which is difficult for people, especially if they have an image of themselves. I'm Mr. Olympia. I'm this guy. And that's who I am. Not, who you are can be evolving all the time. It depends on who you think you are. That's who you are, who you think you are. And um, I realized about five or six years ago, I was still doing the bodybuilding lifestyle um, not the steroids, but you know the lifestyle, the training, the diet, and everything like that. I was about eighteen and a half stone, and uh, went for a checkup, and my blood pressure was getting a bit high. And I said, like, I just you need to change. I changed my diet. Uh, I started doing yoga and cycling and fitness training, and I purposely lost muscle. But I didn't care anymore because I'm like, I don't need it. I don't need that. It's not serving me anymore. I need to be able to be mobile and fit. And I don't want to be in pain. And I don't want to be, uh, you know, disabled. This is the only vehicle I've got to experience life in. And if it's not working properly, the quality of life in the experience is not so good. So I enjoy hiking up the mountains now, riding bike, doing different things like that. I do a little bit of lightweight training. Do a little bit of cardio, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of everything. And I want my body to be functioning optimally. I still have some injuries. I have quite bad shoulder injuries, which they don't give me any pain from day to day. But it limits me. I can't do any kind of heavy lifting anyway. But I just accept it. And But I can do other things. I can stand on one foot now and do yoga. couldn't do that 20 years yeah. ago. So there's always something you can do. But <clears throat> you have to be able, you have to know when something that you were doing in the past is not really the best thing for you now. And you have to be able to evolve and change. And hopefully that's what I'm doing. And I'm, the feedback that I'm getting now is I'm inspiring other people. I'm getting other bodybuilders saying, you know, I'm 40 now, I'm 45. Uh, I really, you've, in, you've inspired me in bodybuilding, but now you've inspired me in what you're doing after bodybuilding, that you've, you're able to change and, and your health is good and everything like that compared to a lot of other people they're not doing so well yeah, that's the um, main thing like your, your health is your wealth but for you yeah. to get that injury then change lanes like everything does happen for a reason a lot of people don't adjust a lot of people don't adapt to try and stick to the old habits even though they know it's killing them because they think it's, it's all they know it's comfort zone yeah it's, all it's they know. comfortable to do what you know uh, and you've always done it uh, it's comfortable well, it might not be the best thing for you. And I'm, I'm not saying change is easy. It's often not easy to give up stuff. Um, when I started thinking about it, I was like, yeah, but people expect me to be big and, and you know, you're a Mr. Olympia. I was like, screw what people expect. Screw what people think. And who knows what people are thinking anyway? You know, you don't know what people are thinking. And even if you did, it's irrelevant what other people are thinking. It's your life. Yeah? You've got to live your life for yourself, not for anyone else. Not for your parents, not for your wife, not for your fans, if you've got any or whatever. You've got to live your life for you. It's your life. And you've got to decide what you want to do with that life and uh, try to cut out that outside influence. And... It's very difficult these days, especially with the social media and everything. There's so much pressure coming. Uh, and a lot of it's bullshit anyway. People posting their perfect lives. And uh, I don't think anyone has a perfect life. So if we can be open and honest and talk to each other about our challenges, that we help each other and we all advance. So that's what I try and do. How long do you think you'd have done 
body building for if you never got that injury? Well, 97, when I got the injury, to be honest, was the first time when I was really questioning what I'm doing. Why? Because I did it to such an extreme, I started to think there must be more to life than this. You were thinking that where you were? Yeah, I was already thinking game. that as I was getting ready for this contest. I'm like, this is starting to feel like a job, not a passion. Of course, it was a job because I'm earning my living doing it, but it didn't feel like a job. The last one, it started to feel like a job and like, this is Groundhog Day. And it's just doing the same thing over and over again. What You're going to start thinking about what you want to do with your life outside of this. Um, so the thoughts were already there before the injury came along. Uh, so I don't know. Everyone was always like, are you going to try to match or beat Lee Haney's eight Mr. Olympias? I honestly never thought about it. I'm like, I'm just going to take one year at a time as long as I'm enjoying it and I feel that I could possibly make some improvements, then I'll keep doing it. And that last year, yeah, some of the joy was going out of it. So I don't think I would have done it much longer anyway, but being like a control and a planner, I want to be able to control and plan my exit and my retirement, but that was taken out of my hands anyway. Uh, that was very difficult for me. What was a, a day like in your life that, Food-wise, exercise, steroids, what was the full day planned out? Depend on if it was off-season or contest. Contest is more things to do. It's like really is all day. <clears throat> so I'll give you a contest, um, which would be maybe three months out of the year, contest prep. So I would do, um, in the morning, I'd have, I might have some water and a coffee. I'd do 45 minutes cardio, but not moderate cardio. So I was usually stationary cycling in the morning. Um, then I'd have breakfast and, uh, you know, some steroids you take daily, like the oral, the tablets you take daily, some injections weekly or biweekly or something like that. But that's obviously part of it. Uh, breakfast. I don't know. The contest, would, I was eating a lot of egg whites at that point. Um, we used, as I said, <clears throat> the general feeling was fat is bad, but now... I've learned that it's not. So if I'd done it now, I'd probably put more egg yolks in as well. But it's primarily egg whites, like maybe <clears throat> 12 egg whites, a few egg yolks, a couple of hundred grams of porridge oats. Um, then I'd do uh, maybe do a little bit of work, have a shake before I went to the gym, sit down in my office, get out my training logs, see what I did last week. And then I would visualize what I'm doing today the order of the exercises, the weights I'm going to use, what rep range I'm going to aim for. Uh, I'd see what clothes I'm wearing, what music is playing, all this stuff. I would visualize. So I'm almost in like kind of a trance. And then I would drive to the gym. My training partner would be waiting for me and I would be like, all right, no conversation. He knows what we're going to do. I know what we're going to do. And... Uh, we get to work, total focus on the workout that we had to do, which was maybe an hour at the most, but very, very intense. Then I might hang around for a bit at the gym bullshit, have a laugh with a guy. I would change into a different person once that workout was over. You couldn't talk to me while I'm training. I wouldn't even acknowledge anybody. The gym would be empty prime mostly anyway. But if people came down, there would be, oh, I would have just look at the floor. I wouldn't catch anyone's eye so no one would disturb me afterwards i'd you know I'd chat with the guys a bit go home um have lunch then i would sleep in the afternoon a couple of hours then i would eat again then i'd do some posing practice and do some more cardio eat again and evenings i would do some phone calls and letters we didn't have emails so it's just mail and uh, watch a movie every day. I was Blockbuster's best customer, they told me. I said, you rented more movies from us than anybody else. <laughs> I was like, yeah, because I watch one or two every day. <laughs> so every movie I know for the last 20 or 30 years, I know all the movies. What's the best one you've ever watched? That's too hard. Everyone, someone's asked me that before, and I said, I can't, I can't. Mate. It's, it's watched so many, I've watched every bloody single movie, so I, I can't pull out a single one. I've watched 
watched everything. But uh, is that just to keep you occupied and stay busy? Yeah, and stay to relax and yeah. just take my mind off everything and just you know you get into the movie, don't you? Know, that's uh, the way. And I like reading a lot as well, so read quite a bit. I read probably more now than I used to then, but I love reading because that's how I learned about bodybuilding. That's how I learned about everything. Reading. It's oh, a good thing. You? When I was a kid, I started reading young, and I just loved to read. I find it relaxing. I couldn't even get a newspaper with nothing particularly interesting there and read it. It just sends me into a relaxed state. So I love reading, and now I read to learn. I'm always trying to learn more, learn more about um, spirituality, learn more about the human body and the potential of the body and the mind. And it's it's amazing. There's new information coming out all the time. If you're keeping on top of this. Uh, curve human potential is like I don't know, it's, it's not, we've done nothing man like just scratch the surface I think the human potential is amazing and I think it's been hidden from us and I think it's been almost like indoctrinated and, and trained out of us through the school system and the media and the uh, and everything it's just trying to dumb us down all the time so you've got to get out there and um, educate yourself yeah, and that's the most important thing. The more you, the more you learn, the more you earn as well. That, that's why I question everything, think everything's a lie. I question everything. I, I told my kids. Uh, I got a boy who's thirty-seven now, Lewis. Tarnish is twenty. And I told them both from the start, like, question everything. I said, in that school, you'll learn some mathematics. You'll learn how to read and write, but beyond that, it's indoctrination. Sit down, stand up, sit there for seven or eight hours. Isn't it strange that the school hours are pretty much the same as the work hours that they're programming you for? So just give you enough information so you can be a useful cog in the system, a useful worker. Nothing more than that. They're not going to show anything more than that. You're going to need to find it. And even if I tell you something, I could be wrong. Question me. It's not a problem. Question everything. Go look for yourself and find... That's what people have got to do. Research, man. Find out for yourself. It's all out there. Seek and you'll find. If you want to find something, you look and eventually you'll find it. But it takes that willingness to question and, and to want to know. I think a lot of people are just, they're almost hypnotized. Give up. You question things, people think you're crazy. Yeah, because uh, everyone's hypnotized and we're, you know, we are our own sheepdogs almost. You know? You got the herd, you got the herd of sheep. If one sheep steps out, all the other ones start going, rah, rah, look at you. You're not dressed right. You're not doing the right thing. You're not saying the right thing. Get in, get in, get in. Because they start feeling uncomfortable. Why is this guy not walking in the circle that we've been told to walk in? He's walking the other way. What's wrong with him? And it makes them feel uncomfortable um, that, that you're being different. But everybody that was anything has always been called crazy. You know, anybody that was ahead of the time was always called crazy. And later on, he's called, that guy was an innovator, you know? But at the time when he said it, it was called crazy. Yeah. Because, you 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 know, if you're questioning the norm or what's generally accepted, you're crazy. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a crazy fucker, man. Is that when the journey started after you got your injury and decided you weren't going to do building, in, build building anymore? Is that when you had a depression and kind of... Yeah, and... Uh... I had a death of somebody that was close to me as well that I couldn't figure out. He was very young. My nephew he was uh, 15 or 16, and he died in my house. And there was never a never a cause. He just died in his sleep. And it just, just done my head, and I couldn't. Everything in my life was logic and put it in a box, and I could understand it, and I could work it out. It's mathematics. This was so I, this sent me on a whole uh, journey of, question everything and reading and you know going down a very deep rabbit hole yeah is that when you decided okay you wanted there's more to life not just standing on a stage you know what it was I, I i found out a lot of stuff and it was almost so heavy and so overwhelming that i after a while i hid away from it and i just wanted to party and date more girls and just forget about it, yeah, for a while. So I went into this whole, just, I'm just going to have a good time. Like I lived like a monk for 12 years, didn't do anything. I found out all this stuff, but it's heavy and what can I do about it anyway? So I went down the party route for a bit until that became 
like this is not doing you any good this is now damaging you so you know as extreme over here as a bodybuilder i went over this way extreme the other way i'm just gonna have a good time and party and but all this time i'm still training i'm still loving to exercise but if it was a weekend i'm doing some coke i'm drinking i'm partying having different girlfriends all it's a distraction and then i grew out of that and carried back on the journey that i kind of started then but it was it was a bit too much for me at the, at the start was that a block out the pain that you didn't want to face maybe or maybe it's just uh as i say it's just a reaction to the extremity of this where i never had a drink i never went out i didn't socialize to like hey parties are fun yeah and i missed out on all this and there's all these girls and uh, it's fun and so I swung that way for a while until uh, eventually I've swung back into the middle and got some kind of balance. And I had to experience that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be the full person I am now. I wouldn't be able to relate to a lot of things. I had to, I had to live. I had to live a life. My life was from my house to the gym and back, and from my house to the gym and back, and to the contest and to some appearances, and it's bodybuilding. I had to have more life experience and some ups and some downs, and uh, I've definitely been there, been through all that. But it makes you, it made me who I am now. So none of it, it I have regrets for none of it, you know. But that's why people can relate to you as well. When you go to the brinks of hell, when you fuck up, when you make mistakes, when yeah. you're not perfect. Because every man thinks they look good every man thinks they can fight like yeah. probably bodybuilders and boxers probably get the most shit than anybody because people can't do those things yeah. and then there becomes a lot of envy and hate did see when you started letting the barriers come down did did you see it feel like a lot of other losers and wasters came into your circle as well people with no ambitions because it felt normal when you're going down that slope a little bit yeah a little bit you get into that party scene you know and uh, i think it was um so Noel Gallagher once he said, drugs, it's like having a cup of tea. It is if you hang around with people that, that do that because it's everyone's doing it, so it becomes the norm, you know? Um, but when you're doing that, you're not, your energy is not focused. So slowly some things started, start to fall apart around you, you know, because you're not taking care, you're not focusing, you're going out partying and then you you got a hangover or you're in your bed for a day or two days and you just, everything in life is what you focus on. So if you focus on sex and drugs and parties, you'll get a lot of them. But the other things start falling apart because you're not taking care, you're not focusing on them. Um, so I learned that and I learned it's also another thing that's not going to be good for your health and... Uh, that my health became my priority at some point. You know, you take it for granted when you're younger. When you're getting older, you, you probably uh, become more aware of it. So what I do now is uh, I want to optimize my health and uh, my spirituality and my understanding of what's going on and uh, have balance. So I think I'm getting there. You know, you never, you never arrive at that destination is so always ongoing you're always learning and i'm sure i'll make more mistakes and learn more things because normally you learn when you make mistakes what is spirituality to you dorian pretty much what i was describing earlier on I, you know it's not about having all the answers it's about an awareness that we're much more than this and there is much more than this there's you know this table, this room, it's not even real, really. It's just the program that we're perceiving. It's all made of atoms, so how can it how can it be solid? It's a perception, it's like a program we're in, and there's much more outside of this. And that I was realized and saw and felt and knew when I did psychedelics. Because it just takes you to a different place. When was the first time you'd done psychedelics? What was it DMT or Alaska first? It was actually ayahuasca but the first thing i ever did was was um ayahuasca really but i did it in totally 
the wrong circumstances and probably very dangerous circumstances, but I didn't know at the time because I was ignorant. Um, so I went to Brazil and I met a girl who is now my wife. I met her in Brazil. And we planned a trip together to go to the Amazon. So we went out to the Amazon and I met a guy, some guides out there that were going to take us on a boat and we're going to go down the Amazon River and for a few days and sleep on the boat or sleep on the, the beach at the side of the river and all this stuff. So I was already, uh, you know, uh, a cannabis smoker. Yeah. So I wouldn't, maybe it's slightly psychedelic, but not really. So I was already into that. I already spent some time living in Amsterdam and spending time wandering around and reading books. And so I'd read about DMT and ayahuasca. So I had some understanding about it. Uh, 10, 11 years ago, so it probably wasn't so mainstream as it is now. And uh, I said to the guy, I said, can you get me some ayahuasca stuff? Uh, I don't know much about it, but you're supposed to go on this journey and see visions and get information and all that. I'd like to have a go at that. And he said, yeah, of course, you know, give me the money and I'll get it. So I don't know really if it was real ayahuasca, but uh, it probably was. He got me two bottles full and... Uh, so no preparation, nothing. You know, I, I headline an ayahuasca camp in Costa Rica. I've done three of them now, and there's there's a real preparation. You know, you, you, there's no uh, alcohol, no weed, nothing like that for two weeks minimum before, and no sex, no meat, no dairy. There's a lot of preparation that goes into preparing yourself physically and mentally for this uh, ceremony, which is conducted by shamans in a very strict uh way so no shaman no instructions no nothing and the night before i was drinking vodka and doing lines of coke <laughs> and i'm gonna go and do i ask you in the jungle right <laughs> so one of the guys he was uh native blood you know so he's telling me oh, i've done ayahuasca and he's telling me a bit about it and he said you know you're probably gonna throw up you might shit yourself it's you know it's not gonna be pretty but you'll learn something so, okay. So he said, uh, you're smoking weed yesterday, weren't you? I said, yeah. He said, don't, don't smoke any today. You can't mix the weed with the ayahuasca. That's, he said, don't smoke today. I said, all right, huh? Okay, thanks for that. So we're ch 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 chugging along down the, the river, and he's gone to me. Come on. Okay. Gone into the little cabin. The captain's in there with his wheel. There's three big lines of coke on the side. Let's go. Go on, one's for you. They've done one, and the other one's for you. I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing the ayahuasca tonight. It's, no, 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 it's all right. You can have this. You can't smoke weed, though. So, okay. Fed the line of coke. A few hours later, I'm doing ayahuasca. Could have killed myself or something. It's like, but I was not knowing what I was doing. I was not with the right people. So I had ayahuasca. I was violently ill. Didn't get no, I'm like, I'm asking in my head, like, where's the visions? Why I'm not flying like an eagle through the jungle and all this stuff and everything. Stop poisoning yourself. What? Stop poisoning yourself. But no, but where's the, stop poisoning yourself. That's all I heard in my head. And I didn't get it at the time. I thought I was, I don't know, I didn't get it. And everyone was asking me, how was it, Ayahuasca? Ah, shit, no, I didn't. I just got really sick, mate. It's no good, that stuff. Later on, I did DMT, and I smoked DMT, and whew, out of this world, just left the place and saw the connection of everything. Everything's all connected. Everything is all one thing. It's all one thing. There's nothing separate. It's all one thing. It's all connected, and there's numbers that make shapes, that makes reality, and oh, I've fucking known everything. So I'm telling everybody, fuck that. Now I ask it. DMT, that's the one. Um, because I did it in a totally toxic state, and later on, I realized, you know what? I did get a message from the ayahuasca. Stop poisoning yourself. That's the only message that I needed to get at that point. And uh, then my next experience was, I was in Spain. I was involved in a gym business over there. It's a long story, but it was really stressful. And I was slipping into anxiety and depression. I wasn't sleeping. I was insomnia. I was I was in a bad place, and I was doing yoga, and my yoga teacher said, hey, um, 
I'm going to the ceremony in a couple of weeks, ayahuasca. Like, maybe it can help you. Like, you want to come along? I just, ah, I don't think so. Because I did it before and it was horrible. And I did DMT. It's much better. You don't get sick or anything. So, nah, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know, but I don't think I'm going to come. Then a friend of mine uh, messaged me, a girl actually, who came to me at some point for some help and I helped her, and but we became friends. And she's a very sensitive, uh, sensitive girl. And she said, I've got uh, a message for you. I don't know what it is, but I, I had a vision and I needed to tell you about it. So, so I called her. So what's going on? She said, well, I was painting. And she said, I was painting for hours. I was just lost in this painting. And I went into a trance and had a vision and it concerns you. So I've got to tell you about it. I don't know if I mean anything to you, but I'll tell you about it. I said, all right. She said, I was in a jungle and there was just three little native guys squatted down with a, like a big bowl of liquid in front of them and they're stirring it with a, with a piece of wood and they're looking at me and they're just chanting your name, Dorian, 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 Dorian. She said, does it mean anything? I was like, holy shit, does it mean anything? That's ayahuasca. I said, and I've been invited to a ceremony next week. She said, you got to go then, haven't you? You've got to go. And I went, and I, you know, I'd prepared properly this time and everything. And I went, and uh, it was just amazing, profound experience. I, I took the medicine. I spoke with a shaman before. I told him what my problems were. He said, yeah, you're, you know, you're just overstressed. And your heart and your nervous system is under stress. And I'm going to help you with that. So wait, during the ceremony, I'll come around and I'll do some stuff with you and we'll fix this. I said, all right. I took the ayahuasca and felt the effects coming on. I saw a green color in front of me. And I got a female voice in my head saying, hello, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, I remember you. So are you afraid? I said, not afraid, no. She said, no, I'm going to come then. Is that right? Very gentle. And I said, yeah, it's great. She said, you're not going to throw up this time either. She came and just I saw everything that was going on in my life from a totally different perspective. I saw it from everyone else's perspective, even the people that I thought were assholes and they were, you know, they were fucking me up. But I, they were, but not from their perspective. I just saw everything from a different uh, angle. And the next day, the next day I was a totally different person. I even looked different. People were saying to me, the fuck, you had Botox or something? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like all the stress Hello. had gone, you know? Yeah. It's like glowing. I'm like, what? You look great. I was like, I've only had two hours sleep and just went to ayahuasca. Like, you look great. What's happened? Just all that negativity was taken out of me. So then that was the start of my real relationship with ayahuasca, which is it's a plant medicine, but it's got an amazing intelligence. It's beyond our understanding. And I believe that I was even used as a tool to put these camps on in Costa Rica to bring out all the people that came out there because it changed all their lives and they're now changing other lives. It's like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the plants live on this planet as well as we do. So they don't want us to fuck up the planet because they live here as well. So they're trying to talk to us. And ayahuasca is a master teacher plant. So... It's a form of intelligence. And I, I had three camps, 20 people. And we formed WhatsApp groups for all the people. And to this day, they're all in touch. Like yesterday, I was watching. I don't go on there all the time, but I'm watching them communicating. They're doing Zoom calls. They're sharing all the experiences. Their lives have just changed, and they're helping other people. One person's opening uh, a flotation tank business and it's all around spirituality and they've all all their lives have changed tremendously for the better so um somehow i was used as a tool to do that to attract those people because they looked up to me because they're from the gym world yeah it's powerful plants uh, that I, I believe all the plants here that there's cures for everything through the plants it's here like, absolutely i went to costa rica and done ayahuasca and i was in hell my life is still going amazing but i still had yeah. to work on myself coming back i still had to work and go to the rooted problems and there's still a lot of shit i've not dealt with and um, that i'm going to deal with over the yeah. next year or two that like, i'm not stupid where i identify where my mistakes are and still things that i need to change i will not shy away from them i'm a human being i still fucking make mistakes but i was in hell and there's also obviously we know during I, the ceremony i was flames fires people dancing i'm thinking fuck yeah. me that like, how can you be enjoying this i was in straight hell man i was in 
But you get what you need, man. Yeah, I was in fucking you get what you need. I've lost a lot of family members and friends to murder and suicide. Yeah. And I think all that shit was kind of connected in the mind and we, we store it all in the subconscious. It's, it's mad, but probably go back and do it again. I, 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 part of me still feels I want to do it for the right reasons and not the escape. A lot of people, yeah. I feel no, like it's not an back escape. too many it's times. It's not an escape. If you think you're going yeah. there to escape, mate, you're going to be a rude yeah. awakening because you're there. You're going to be shown stuff. And then it might not be pleasant at the time. It might be all fun and games, but you never know what's going to happen. And it might not be pleasant. But if it's not pleasant, it's not pleasant for a reason. It's it's a message there. It's just trying to show you something. So every time it's different. And every time you learn something, sometimes more dramatic than other times. Uh, one time was really, really intense. I threw up, I threw up, I threw up until I couldn't throw up anymore. And I actually lost all physical power. I couldn't move and I had to ask for help. And this female was like almost like laughing at me, like, what are you going to do now? Big guy, you know, you've created this armor, this physicality, this, you know, the muscles, the masculinity, the, all this is an armor. But I'm going to take your armor away because then you have to look at what's underneath. And underneath is a little boy that lost his dad and he was scared and all that stuff. Um, so that was a revelation like physically I couldn't move I had, people had to pick me up and carry me because I couldn't move and I had to ask I heard myself asking for help and I was like what the fuck are you doing man I've never really done that before I never wanted to, I never wanted to ask for help I wanted to be independent and strong and uh, we all have to ask for help sometimes and that's what it was showing me like it's okay it's okay to be what you perceive as being weak sometimes and ask for help because no one's an island and you need help sometimes. It's all very well trying to help everybody all the time, but you also need some help sometimes. So every time you go is a different experience and a different message. I, I think it's what you need at the time. Do you think that plays a part with like building yourself up to be the biggest man on the planet to, to then? Do you think that has a connection with, by losing your dad when you say it's a shield, that like the yeah. muscles and the man and do you think that is just a shield to protect yourself because you are feeling vulnerable there's an aspect of it there yeah i it was also a you know it was also my sport it was also my career and my living so it goes beyond that but there's an aspect of it there and i think there's some aspect of that in everybody that starts training um it wasn't really for me like a lot of people start training because they feel like Maybe they're getting picked on and, and stuff like that, and it's a protective mechanism. But that wasn't really happening to me. But deep down, yeah, that kid was there that was wounded and probably wanted to uh, protect himself. But if it was just that, I wouldn't have gone down the whole route of, uh, of competing. So there's that, definitely an aspect of that there. And that's why it's hard for people to, you know, uh, a lot of guys that are using steroids, for me, they're addicted not addicted physically like heroin or maybe cocaine or something like that, but they're addicted to the the image, the outcome. So a lot of guys will take steroids for the rest of their life because they don't want to lose any weight or get any smaller because they think they're losing that. You know, everyone's going to treat them differently now. Right? You're not the big guy. People will treat you differently. Um, but fortunately, I didn't have too much of that, so it wasn't so difficult for me. Mine was more like, oh, what my fans going to think, maybe. You know? That you're not the image that they expect anymore. Yeah, do you feel that when you're 240, 250 pounds and then you stop taking what you're taking and then the, the, maybe the strength goes down a bit? Do you feel that? And you, you, does that I, I don't. think that you maybe want to go back I don't really that? feel that, but it was a question in my mind yeah. that I had to answer to myself. Well, do you live your life for other people? Or do you live your life for you and live your life that you want to live for you? No, I'm going to live the life that I want to live. And people can think what they think. Uh, and that takes a bit of a bit of strength of character to do that. But the conversation was there. You know, the internal conversation was definitely there. But in the end, I was like, you know what? I, I want to be free, yeah? And if you're concerned about other people's opinions, you're never free. You're not a free man. Because you're not living your life. You're living your life, oh, well, better not do this because my mom won't like it, or better not do that because, uh, you know, people will think bad of me, or 
whatever it is, you're not free then, are you? You're a prisoner of other people's, or what you perceive other people to think, because you don't know what they're thinking anyway. Did you ever get some closure or come face to face with the deaths that you lost from your father and your nephew? Um, yeah, one uh, one ayahuasca um, ceremony came out really with, with my nephew that I thought I'd already dealt with it. You know, of course it's traumatic, and but it's I've dealt with it. But there was still some stuff deep deep down there, and it came out with me screaming and banging the floor and crying and it's coming out so that had to come out i didn't even know it was there it's it unlocks some you know some t we we hide things we're not consciously hiding it but subconscious because the brain doesn't want to look at trauma all the time it's stressful so it gets it and puts it in a box in the back and locks it away but it's still there your subconscious is affecting you probably more than your conscious so if you've got shit back there that's locked away in a box and you don't even know about it but it's still controlling and still affecting you you need to be able to go in there and open that box up and get it out so mm -hmm. that's the ayahuasca really helped me with that so when you were taking gear and drinking and kind of going down the slippery slope did you ever look at yourself in the mirror and think fuck me like i'm i'm failing here especially being a winner your whole life and being the best you can be everybody looking up to you and then you see the other side the dark side of it did you yeah. ever look at yourself in the mirror towards the end as well I and think. towards the end it was like Hey, you're not really having fun anymore. It's not fun anymore. You know, it's all fun at first, but at some point it changes and it's not really fun anymore. And you see people around you, their lives are going to shit. And uh, okay, this chapter is coming to a close. Let's close the, close the page on this chapter. So yeah, I realized it, but uh, it was never like I was a, you know, uh, non-functional or uh, something like that. I was still doing my thing. I was still going to the gym and training. But if there was a weekend and there was a party, then it's a party, you know, it's on. And I've been all around the world, like New York, Vegas, LA, Australia, everywhere. I've been parties all around the world and every nightclub bouncer knows me. So <laughs> I was getting, you know, getting the VIP services as well. How was Joe Rogan? Joe was uh, cool, and I, I already know because I followed Joe Rogan on his page, so I knew we had a lot in common. You know, psychedelics. He, he smokes weed, he's been into the psychedelics, he's into optimizing his physicality, his, uh, you know, he does martial arts and, and things like that, and I'm from a different background, but I knew we had a lot in common. Um, somebody from my team contacted the producer, and that was the conversation. So we just set up a time, and I went into the studio. The producer was there. We had a little chat, blah, 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 blah. Joe turned up. Hey, how are you? And we shook hands and say hello. And then, boom, we went straight into the, the conversation, which went on for three hours. And we were both like, is that really three hours? We, we ran out of time, but it was just flowing a good uh, conversation. And I think he's really good at his job. He must, I don't know how many bloody podcasts he does, but it almost seems to be like one a day. Mm -hmm. And he's doing his comedy show and he's doing his training. So he's a busy guy. And, um, you know, yourself, every guest you have on, you must do your research and everything. So I think he did a, a good job and the conversation was good. Yeah, it was a cra cracker. Uh, I spent more time with him afterwards, actually. Afterwards, we sat down, we smoked a joint together and we had a, a chat and stuff. I spent some time and... Uh, yeah, I liked him. He was a good guy. What was the decision to move to Spain? Uh, that was because I started going to Marbella. Uh, partying? Yeah. I started, <laughs> started going there. Started going there partying. Started meeting a lot of people. You know, all the security guys out there, they all know me. Uh, a lot of people out there knew me. So I had a lot of contacts. And uh, the weather's amazing. There's a lot of successful people out there in, you know, various fields, right? Uh, a lot of British people there, so you can speak English. It's not, you don't need to, you know, speak Spanish necessarily. Big British community there. Um, so there's the weather. There's the lifestyle. I, I got a place out there, so I was then bouncing back and forth between there and Birmingham, and then I just decided, like, to base myself there more permanently. Just a much better lifestyle. My wife's Brazilian, so she's used to. She didn't really appreciate the British weather too much, um, and 
probably, I don't know, probably everybody experiences this that's somewhat successful. You're never appreciated in your own town, and people are generally jealous of you because familiarity breeds contempt. So if they see you every day, somehow, I don't know what it is, but uh, I find a lot of people kind of, even people that you think you're friends and are close to you secretly, they're a little bit jealous of your success. If you're surrounded by other people that are very successful, like in Marbella, I'm just another person out there, nothing really, you know, outstanding. You don't stick out, you don't stand out. So um, it's a better environment as well. And if you're surrounded by more other more successful people, that also can be motivating and inspiring to yourself rather than you're just always the guy that's a bit above everybody else, so to speak. Yeah. What do you think life is, Dorian, from, from your eyes? Life is uh, is an experience. It's almost like a test as well. Um, to go through these experiences, to go through these challenges in a physical body, because we're not physical, we're, we're spirits, yeah? It's like, this is a TV set I've got, yeah? I'm not the TV, I'm the signal that comes to the TV. And when this TV breaks down, the signal still exists, right? If you've got a radio, and it's picking up radio one, and one day your batteries run out of your radio, radio one still exists, right? It's just not picking up anymore. You have to go buy a new radio, transit and pick it up again. So I think we're, our spirit, our signal is eternal. It's just going through different challenges and different phases. I even think that before we come here, we're conscious and we choose our challenges, we choose our circumstances to a degree. Uh, and then, you know, we get here, we got insomnia. And you're just trying to find your way back. And we're all part of God, the universe, the source, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, we're all part of it. It's not something separate where you've got to find your way there to that place. Like that's what religion teaches you. You're just you, and God's over there, and you've got to find your way back by doing ABC, which is basically what we're wanting to do. Um, we're already we're already part of it. Just like if you use a little drop of water in the ocean, you're still the ocean as well. A cell in your body, it's not you, is it? But it's part of you, so it's still, you know, it's still you, but it's, it just thinks it's a cell. It only knows it's a cell. It doesn't know it's all part of of you, of your body, so I see it like that, and this insights I've basically got through doing psychedelics and being sh shown and feeling and knowing these things. Very hard to describe psychedelic experiences because you're working with words that just somehow are not enough. You know, anyone that's done psychedelics will know what I'm talking about, but it's not just see it, you feel it, you know it, you're there, you're part of everything, everything's part of you, you're not separate. And just having a temporary experience now. Um, that's why often people just start pissing themselves off and sometimes. Because you see it all. That was it, me. It's all a game. Yeah. I'm just playing a bloody game. Like, when you're a kid, you ever got the Monopoly board out? And you're all playing Monopoly. And it gets a bit fucking serious. It gets a bit heated about the Monopoly game. It's only a fucking Monopoly game. And afterwards, when the game's over, you put the board back and put it back in the box. It's like that. Life's just a game. I know that, but I still fucking take it seriously sometimes and I still get down and still get depressed. But ultimately, it's just a game not to be taken too seriously. You come here for, a, for an experience and then when that experience is over, you'll be back where you came from and maybe you're coming back for another experience. Yeah, we've all got different chapters in my life, like some good, some bad. Yeah. What's the best you've, you've felt? What chapter? The now? Uh, I felt like I've lived... A lot of different lives. Like I got friends that I grew up with when we were skinheads and we were in this phase of being skinheads and punks and they tell me, do you remember them days? That was the best days of our lives. Like I remember and it was good, but I got loads of those chapters in my life that, you know, um, that, that are good and some that are bad. And I feel more peaceful now than I've ever felt before. I feel like, I'm understanding things, I'm understanding myself, and uh, I've got more balance. Ultimately, everything comes to balance, like even sports, like sports, exercise is healthy, right? It's good for you, but competitive sports are not. 
not just bodybuilding, not any competitive sport is not necessarily good for you, good for your health, because it's an extreme. So it all comes back to balance. You know, getting kicked in the head in the martial arts, not good for you. Doing triathlons, doing marathons, it's not good for you. It's aging your body, it's damaging your cells. Go for a little jog, do a bit of weight training, yeah, it's good for you, but at the extreme, it's not. So anything extreme is not, but maybe you have to experience it to get the full realization. Yeah. Coming up to 60, you look great, by the way. Thanks. What's the plans for the future? Well, um, continue down the path, continue down the path of, of learning and uh, trying to inspire other people and bring more light, bring more light to the, to the planet. I'm doing, playing my role in that. We're going through a big transition now. Almost in simplistic terms, if you like, it's a bit like Star Wars, you know, between the, the force and the, the dark and the light. And the, right now is a big uh, transition, a big wrestling match going on between between that. That's why, we're, you know, it's the time that the human race is going to wake up more and realize its potential. But there's a dark side here that don't want that to happen. So it's trying very hard now to su crush our spirit and suppress us and kill a lot of us as well at the same time. So it's all going on, but I have faith that the ultimate outcome is that all this stress is going to lead to, in the end, to more light. That's what I believe. That's what I keep faith in. Yeah, it's scary, man, to think that the world is upside down, but there's a lot of goodness in it's the world. It's always been upside down. Yeah. The world has always been upside down. Uh, if you take everything that you believe or everything the average person believes to be true and turn it right upside down, it will be nearer to the truth already. Um, and I think these are the times, it's like, uh, it's like the water's going down in the lake and all the things that was at the bottom of the lake that was hidden in the murky water is going to be uh, coming to light and it's not pretty a lot of it yeah um and a lot of people not even ready for it you know so it's going to happen over a period of time uh if if everybody knew the reality of the world right now is just it would be chaos so it takes a bit of time for it to all come out but slowly it will come in out even all about this false pandemic it's starting to slip out now even into the mainstream uh, the truth is starting to slip out. You can't hide the truth forever. It will come out, and it, I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah. Brother, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. You're a great Thanks, man. Thanks, James. Great things. How can people get involved in your retreats? Um, well, I'm, I don't have one scheduled at the moment. We had one last year, but I had to cancel it um, because of the situation. Mm -hmm. So, um, Soltara is the the camp out in uh, costa rica even if i'm not there and you want to do it i would recommend it's a great place great facilities very professional very caring um but i may be doing one later in the year uh, at saltara so you can look out for that um of course you can find me on instagram and uh check out my company at dy nutrition i'm doing various other things i'm doing online coaching now as well dy academy so you can you can find me at various places, and uh, as far as the retreat goes, um, yeah, maybe later in uh, next year I'll be going out there. We will leave all the links in the description, you, brother. Maybe you should come out with me, mate. Yeah, come out to Saltara yeah, for your second one. Yeah, because I've got a lot of people in the pipeline as well. What I kind of get involved in, they're all going through that journey and transition, just wanting more and looking for answers. And well, Saltara is good because they don't have really big groups. It's maximum twenty people, so, and yeah, there's a lot. Of, they get a lot of care and a lot mm -hmm. of help there. So. Uh, yeah yeah let's see what we can do but for for the future brother I wish you all the luck and, um, thank no you doubt we'll much. have you on for a part two no doubt we'll be teaming up alright next time I'm up in Glasgow yeah <laughs> alright god bless you brother alright thanks a lot thanks guys yes.